This is the Emergency Medical Minute, sponsored by Health One. Hello, Emergency Medical Minute listeners. This is Dr. Rachel Duncan, Emergency Medicine Clinical Pharmacist, here to give you your first Pharmacy Friday Medical Minute. I'm going to let you, the listeners, decide if that pharmacy starts with an F or PH for the title. Now, of course, today we're going to do our favorite topic, everyone's favorite topic, and that would be, drumroll please, infectious disease. I know we all love infectious disease. In fact, this was my favorite module in school. I'm totally kidding. I hated it and barely passed it. But throughout the last decade of practice, I've really learned to appreciate it more, as it's definitely a topic that um, is in every part of medicine, especially emergency medicine. In fact, some of my favorite people and colleagues are my infectious disease pharmacists. Um, They've taught me a lot. And if you don't know an ID pharmacist, I would highly encourage um, you to find one, get their cell phone number. Um, put it in your phone and have them on speed dial. Whether I'm at work, not at work, whether they're at work, not at work, they're constantly getting phone calls from me asking for help. So that is my plug for all ID pharmacists out there. Um, Find one, become friends, and call them frequently because they will help you. Um, Today we are specifically going to talk about antibiotics, which of course is fun for pharmacists because that's very pharmacy heavy. And we are going to talk about the drug class, antibiotic class of the fluoroquinolones. Now, fluoroquinolones have been around a while um, and we used to use them a lot, especially when I first started practicing. I feel like levofloxacin specifically was kind of the ER wonder drug, right? So someone comes in with a skin and soft tissue infection, levofloxacin. Someone comes in with a UTI, they get levofloxacin. Someone comes in with community acquired pneumonia needs to go home, levofloxacin. It was the drug we were giving to everyone. And why did we love it so much? Well, a few different things. And first and foremost, it was easy to take. It was once a day dosing, which is a lot better than many of the antibiotics out there. You can sometimes get away with a shorter duration for some indications. It was perfect for all those pesky, quote unquote, penicillin allergies. Um, And, you know, as long as you dose adjusted it, it was still okay for patients with renal dysfunction. Beyond the ease of use, it really has a quite wide spectrum of bugs that it covers, including but not limited to Enterococcus, E. coli, Haemophilus, Klebsiella, Moraxella, Mycoplasma pneumonia, Proteus, Staph, and Strep. And when I hear all those bugs, I think of those types of infections that we talked about that we see all the time in the ER, um, particularly UTI and upper respiratory infections. And then there's even some coverage for those really annoying space bugs that are, can be hard to treat, like Seratia, Pseudomonas, Acinobacter, Citrobacter, and Enterobacter. Um, So these really were used quite a bit, I would say, in the past 10 to 15 years. Because we've used them so much, we've really come up with some new information on maybe why we shouldn't be using fluoroquinolones as much. So this overutilization really led to three con- the discovery of three concerns. Number one, patient adverse reactions. We'll chat about those, and those really go hand in hand with number two, an increased risk of safety concerns. And then number three, um, dun, 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 the development of drug resistance. We overutilize fluoroquinolones so much um, that uh, many drugs did develop resistance against them. So because of those three things, we really don't recommend using them as much anymore. And before I go any further, I would like to give a shout out to one of my favorite ID pharmacists, Nicole Neville. Dr. Neville is responsible for a lot of this knowledge that I gathered together um, for this uh, medical minute. Um, So thank you, Dr. Neville. So that first issue that we talked about, patient adverse reactions. You're probably pretty familiar with most of these. The first one being QTC prolongation. 
In pharmacy school, we have to memorize a really long list of medications that can lead to QTC prolongation. And for quinolones, every single one of them is on that list. Other things like organ dysfunction, hepatotoxicity specifically is a concern with the fluoroquinolones, photosensitivity, and a lot of drug-drug interactions, just to name a few. And then adverse effects are increased specifically in both the elderly and pediatric populations. So in the very young and the very old, I especially try to avoid fluoroquinolones because these populations have higher rates of these adverse effects and safety concerns than, let's say, a normal, healthy middle-aged person. So let's talk about some of these safety concerns. Over the past several years, a multitude of safety data has been released regarding fluoroquinolones. In fact, FDA post-marketing studies have shown several adverse events related to fluoroquinolone use, including increased risk of Clostridium difficile infection, so that gift that just keeps on giving, tendonitis and tendon rupture, not only in pediatric patients, but throughout the entire age spectrum, worsening of myasthenia gravis, other types of neuropathy issues like peripheral neuropathy, um, severe hypoglycemia, which we know can be very dangerous and even lead to death in some patients, mental health side effects, and then most recently discovered um, an increased risk of aortic blood vessel rupture. So a lot of reasons not to be using fluoroquinolones. In fact, all of these safety concerns have led to a, a new term that is called fluoroquinolone-associated disability, which is luckily abbreviated as FQAD. Now, the FDA recently released a report about these different disabilities. And so what they did is they looked at um, the percentage of disability reports among all serious outcome reports was selected antibiotics. So they took a bunch of different antibiotics um, specifically for the treatment of uncomplicated sinusitis, bronchitis, and UTI, three things we often treat in the ER and send patients home on antibiotics for. And amongst all of those serious outcome reports for each of those antibiotics, they looked at the percentage that actually led to a disability report. And no surprise there, the top five culprits are all fluoroquinolones. In fact, when you look at, look at ciprofloxacin, almost 30% of those serious outcome reports led to a disability report. Levofloxacin is close behind it at almost 27%. When you compare this to other drug classes, for example, we have amoxicillin at a low 6%. And then cephalexin, our favorite cephalosporin, comes in at less than 3%. So just to put that into perspective for you. So all of this information has actually led to a couple of U.S. box warnings, a.k.a. black box warnings, for all of the fluoroquinolones. Number one, just being labeled serious adverse reactions. So this black box warning is for disabling and potentially irreversible serious adverse reactions, including tendonitis and tendon rupture, peripheral neuropathy, and other CNS effects. They even go on to say patients of any age or without pre-existing risk factors have experienced these reactions. And the really scary thing is that these can occur within hours of a dose, even after a single dose while well, other types of reactions may not occur for weeks after initiation. So that's even scarier, I think, because it's so unpredictable. The second U.S. box warning is for exacerbation of myasthenia gravis. So because of these various concerns, the FDA has really recommended that fluoroquinolones be reserved when alternative antimicrobial agents are not available. So beyond these adverse um, effects and various safety concerns. Our number three reason not to use fluoroquinolones is that they now have terrible susceptibility rates at many institutions, and it's probably due to that overuse of um, fluoroquinolones for decades. And so when we look at various institutional antibiograms, which I would highly suggest you ask your ID department um, for an antibiogram, bugs like E. coli, Proteus, Pseudomonas often have susceptibility rates in the 60s, as in 60%.
Now for another example here at my own institution, um, levofloxacin susceptibility um, for MRSA is approximately 20%. So it just goes to show overuse of these antibiotics has led to resistance, making them even less useful. So let's talk about various situations where fluoroquinolones are used inappropriately that I often see. So number one most common reason that I see is that fluoroquinolones are being used for a quote-unquote allergy when the allergy listed may not be a true allergy or the patient has received and tolerated a penicillin or cephalosporin in the past. So make sure you dig into those that allergy information a little bit more and look to see what the patient has received in the past. Second reason, very similar to the first, fluoroquinolones being utilized for a non-severe allergy when they could have tolerated a cephalosporin due to minimal cross-reactivity with penicillins. And we are actually going to talk next week more about cross-reactivity between cephalosporins and penicillins um, and when to use which cephalosporin based off of various allergies. Third reason, fluoroquinolones being utilized to treat an infection when an alternative agent could have been used based on the susceptibility pattern of the organism even despite an allergy listed. So make sure that you are looking at your MICs coming back. And the fourth most common, especially in the ER, is fluoroquinolones being utilized for pneumonia. When that patient has no known drug allergies and there is no other reason that the patient could not have utilized a penicillin or cephalosporin. So let's talk about a few disease specific states commonly seen in the ED and what the appropriate empiric antibiotic choice would be. Let's start out with pneumonia. We're all familiar with Community Acquired Pneumonia, or CAP. This previously probably would have been treated most commonly at your institution 10 years ago with something like a single agent of levofloxacin. Well, we now know, due to those three reasons we talked about, that we should be using ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. And this can be used whether a patient is getting admitted or going home, you can replace that ceftriaxone with another um, oral cephalosporin um, or just do azithromycin alone. Now, if that patient has a history of MRSA, of course, we would go ahead and add vancomycin and they're getting admitted. With a history of pseudomonas, we would upgrade that ceftriaxone to cefepime. And if they come in with a true hospital acquired, or if you're already in the hospital and have a ventilator acquired pneumonia, um, let's say you're getting a transfer patient into your ER from a facility, you would of course go to something like cefepime plus vanco and make sure that you're covering pseudomonas and MRSA. The only time I may consider levofloxacin for some type of pneumonia is in a patient with CAP with a severe life-threatening allergy to the beta-lactams. Even then, I would probably do a little bit more investigation into their allergy. The second indication that I'd like to talk to you about today is urinary tract infection. So very common reason that we see patients in the ER. Often the majority of our culture report the next day is from urine cultures. And so for an uncomplicated UTI, of course, you're going to be reaching for something like a first-generation cephalosporin, so cephalexin, or an oldie but goodie nitrofurantoin or macrobid often has great susceptibilities. Alternatives could be upgrading that cephalosporin a little bit, maybe to something like cefuroxime, considering your Bactrim, or even going to something like Augmentin. Again, you'll notice in all of this, there is no ciprofloxacin coming into it. Now, for complicated UTI pyelonephritis, or maybe a catheter-associated UTI, you may go to something like ceftriaxone or cefepime, depending on the risk of resistant organisms. Remember that you're going to um, go from ceftriaxone to cefepime if you have any risk of pseudomonas there. Oral options for these more complicated infections could be something like cefuroxime, ceftinur, or even Bactrim. And again, the only time I may consider ciprofloxacin for UTI is if the patient has a known history of pseudomonas 
or an ESBL organism. And even then, I'm going to look at my micro susceptibility reports and see if there's another agent that I might utilize instead. The third type of infection that I want to chat about is intra-abdominal infection. So for a community-acquired intra-abdominal infection, you're looking at something like ceftriaxone plus your anaerobic coverage, so metronidazole. If it's something very severe or healthcare-associated, you may be jumping to something like zosin or cefepime flagell combination. And then for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, we're going to be using ceftriaxone. I get a lot of questions about, well, what about SBP prophylaxis? Isn't that really the place for fluoroquinolones? Well, actually, just food for thought, Bactrim actually may be considered in place of a fluoroquinolone. So again, another situation where you can avoid using Cipro, which is pretty great. So those are all of the reasons I would not use fluoroquinolones. We went through all of the different types of infections and what alternatives I would use instead of a fluoroquinolone. And we're going to finish up now with reasons a fluoroquinolone may be appropriate. We mentioned a couple of specific situations under each of our indications, but here's just a general list. And of course, there are going to be exceptions to this list. Um, there are going to be complicated patients that may require a fluoroquinolone. Um, there may be old MICs that you need to look at, but in general, reasons a fluoroquinolone may be appropriate is one, the patient truly has a severe allergic reaction to alternative agents. And again, just a plug for next week when we talk about some of those allergies. Two, patient's microbiology history shows isolates resistant to alternative agents. As we've seen, there are tons of alternative agents for each of these indications. So that's going to be a lot of resistance to other um, agents. Three, patient has a UTI with a pseudomonas species. And oral therapy is preferred because you want to be able to send them out and not admit them. Four, patient has a suspected or confirmed prostatitis. So if you're unable to use Bactrim, this may be an alternative as it has good prostate penetration specifically. Five, hemom onc patient may be on a fluoroquinolone for prophylaxis. In that case, I don't touch it. Six, certain bacteremia cases for oral step-down options when beta-lactams are either not susceptible or increased oral availability is required based on severity or source of infection. Again, here you're getting into nitty-gritty stuff that you may never even see in the ER patient. And then the last reason, if certain infectious disease consult patients with severe infections or a multi-drug resistant organism shows up, or they have numerous organisms, a fluoroquinolone might be considered the most appropriate um, when you're looking at all the different agents. But that's going to be when you already have an ID doc on the phone as a consult saying, hey, come help me with this patient. Look at their history. They're complicated. What do I use? And again, that's where I also love to call my ID pharmacist for help. So that's what I have for you this week for Pharmacy Friday Emergency Medical Minute all the different reasons not to use fluoroquinolones and what you can use instead. Next week, we're going to chat more about various allergies that have historically been barriers to um, using things like penicillins or cephalosporins, so the beta-lactams in general, how to understand those different allergies more and what cephalosporin could be appropriate depending on what they've tolerated in the past. Um, and just more strategies for us being able to avoid the use of fluoroquinolones. So I will chat with you next week. Bye. We are on a quest to provide the world with free medical education. Please help us out by rating us on iTunes, following us on social media, and subscribing to our newsletter at emergencymedicalminute.com.